today's uh, uh, video blog. Video blog. Thank you. It's going to be about a foreign physician who became part of our family and who meant a lot uh, to us and to him and our lives together. Um, the individual I'm talking about is Y.K. Lee, uh, initials Y.K. stand for Young Keck Lee. He was sometimes called Cliff, and I don't know where that game came. Uh, he was born in Korea and went to a uh, Japanese medical school. He soon became involved in the uh, Chinese army that had come down across the Yellow River. What uh, year was this, Grandpa? Oh, approximately. I don't. I may come across it while we're talking, but right now, I did it. Sorry, Nathan. He uh, he joined the army and uh, was a captain. And spend his time with his men uh, um, fighting off the Chinese uh, for a number of months. And when that quieted down, he moved over to be a surgeon in the uh, Korean army where he took care of wounded and sold wounds and continued his chosen profession. It was sometime in that uh, time that he was encouraged to uh, get better training. Whoever it was, probably somebody from the United States, noticed how uh, he handled the wounds and handled his, his patients. So he made a, uh, an application probably to several hospital centers, one of which was Baylor Medical School. He was accepted in uh, Baylor and Methodist. And when they examined him, to make sure he was in good health. They found he had far advanced tuberculosis because uh, I took care of lung disease. He was referred to me. There was no place in Houston that could really do justice to his care. So I made application and sent him to National Jewish Hospital in Denver. He went up to Denver. Uh, he kept in touch with me uh, by uh, typing letters. Uh, and uh, at the end of 18 months, uh, he was declared uh, bacterial free. When he came home, he said to me, I have a big cavity, but it has no live bacteria. They wanted to operate on me and cut out that part of my lung, but I backed off and thanked them. He came to town and when immediately took over his place in training at Methodist Hospital in Baylor. 
It's a three-year course, and uh, I was, we sort of lost track of him. Until one afternoon, I got a phone call, and the voice at the other end said, we should be lighting candles, shouldn't we? And I realized Hanukkah was coming, and I said, you're right. And I invited him to dinner with lighted the Hanukkah candles, gave each other gifts. When the dinner was over, he said, your children are very outspoken. <laughs> My children aren't going to talk that way to me. But uh, I told him our cultures were different and uh, we would do the best we could. Uh, towards the end of his three years at Baylor, Methodist, <clears throat> he began to talk about what he should be doing in the way of practice. If he stayed in Houston, as he said, he would be a little frog in a big pond. He would be good and he would be well known, but not the best. He said, that if I go back to Korea, I'll have to get myself a different wife. I have an arranged marriage and I don't like my wife. And then I'll have to do the best I can about setting up a practice. The conversation went back and forth. He spent a lot of time, whatever time he had, talking to grandma, listening to her advice about what to do. Finally, he said, I'm going back to Korea. Uh, we wished him well. A uh, couple of months passed and I got a typed letter from him. And it was the, his experience setting up a practice of medicine, particularly a surgical practice. This was in Korea, in Seoul, Korea, the capital. <clears throat> he said he looked around for a hospital that wasn't very busy, and he came across a small Catholic hospital. It was attached to a, a medical school, also not very much. And he told me his plan. He went about training the nurses in the hospital, training to give anesthetics, training to help him do his surgery, make the hospital uh, more attractive. <clears throat> and he came across his first case which was an abdominal aortic aneurysm. It had never been operated on. That kind of surgery had never been operated on in Korea. And here he was be, going to be the first. So as things went, his training of the nurses the anesthetists, circulating nurses, went well. He opened the patient's abdomen, cleaned out the aneurysm, put a Dacron substitute, and closed the patient. He made sure that it was announced in the newspaper that this was the first abdominal aneurysm repaired 
in the country of Korea. He immediately became a star and started getting more and more unusual surgery to be done. Then I got no letters for a while, and the next letter said, I got a medal, an honor that would be like getting the Nobel Peace Prize. I got that for my surgical procedure. He came back to Houston, uh, stayed with us overnight. His purpose was to learn how to build a medical school. He talked with us. He said, I'm going to talk with Dr. DeBakey, and I'm going to talk to Mr. Bowen. Mr. Bowen was president of the Methodist Hospital. He sat and talked with us, did lend to the way hours, talking about his ambition to make one of the best hospitals in the city of Seoul, in the state and in the country of Korea. He stayed overnight, then went to visit and went back to Korea. He continued uh, operating, becoming more and more in demand. And he came on a second visit to us, spent overnight again, saying he had divested himself of his arranged marriage and married a very beautiful woman whose brother was very wealthy. Uh, his experiences became uh, so widespread that everybody wanted to be operated on him by him. His most ex uh, exciting was that the chief of surgery of the medical school needed to have his accuracy operated on, and Cliff operated on him and was very successful. At about this time, we decided we wanted to go to Korea. The Adaros uh, usually went once a year on a trip because our wedding days were uh, one day apart. So we went to Japan, toured Japan, and then uh, our trip, our, our itinerary took us to Seoul, Korea. Uh, Cliff said he had a hotel and he would be waiting for us. We got to the hotel, Cliff wasn't there, but he came dashing in, ran over to Grandma, jumped in her lap and said, take me back oh. to Texas. Grandma kissed him, hugged him, and wished him well. So then Carl Adoro's guy just met with the chief of psychiatry and a lecture to the medical school on defense mechanisms in mental patients. And I gave a lecture to the internists on transplant of lung in patients with emphysema. The lectures went well. That night, Cliff sent a car for us, and Grandma and I went up to his house on top of a hill 
where his wife and mother-in-law pretend had prepared dinner for us. It was an exciting evening, and Cliff, who has a uh, Western sense of humor, kept us amused for that time. <clears throat> he was particularly close with Grandma. Yes. Grandma understood him, understood what his needs were. And uh, when he came to either see Dr. Bakey or, or uh, Ted Bowen, she always encouraged him and told him the best way to improve, approach his uh, advisors. Um, Do you remember, I'm curious, as to what got him to say that your children were outspoken? Oh, yes. Um, he was very quiet during the meal, but mostly listening to what was going on. But the children would be talking back to me, uh, not paying too much attention to my advice. And uh, it just sort of rubbed him the wrong way. Something no uh, Korean child would dare to do. Uh, and later he told me uh, that he had, he had two sons Neither of them became uh, doctors. Um, I, I can't make any comment about that because my feeling is that he was not a, a good role model. As time passed and he became uh, more and more involved in unusual surgery, he began doing transplant surgery, transplant of uh, lungs, transplant of uh, pancreas, and so on. And when he was, I think in his late 80s, uh, he received a medal <laughs> as the outstanding surgeon in Seoul, Korea. He died probably about six months ago. We talk about him often because how he came from somebody badly scarred with tuberculosis who made the most of everything. We felt we helped him because we were a kind of link to his work. But he was outstanding in what he did, both actually as a soldier for his country and as an outstanding surgeon. It seems ironic to me that he was a surgeon and didn't want to be operated on. For tuberculosis. Uh, Do you think he understood something the surgeons didn't or that he just wanted to see if he would recover on his own? What do you think that was about? I think he rejected the idea of surgery. He was getting so much antibiotic for tuberculosis that uh, it was part of the equation of what he was doing that he was going to get all that antibiotic and be well without being operated on. In a, in a sense it was a mild gamble, but 
what he was really uh, willing to take that gamble to to proceed to do what he wanted to do without being operated on. Did he have any children later in life in his second marriage or? He had uh, no children by his uh, later marriage. I never got to see them. Uh, I just knew that he had two children. His second wife of her was uh, a l l lady of uh, wealth, a lady of uh, strength in his life, which uh, I think he saw that he, if his first wife did not have much power, did not mean much to him. And that's now one of the reasons he wanted to do it on his own. Sounds like quite a guy. Yes, if you can imagine this little man, uh, he could probably not much higher than five feet. Uh, with a good sense of humor, a good laugh, but why a hard, hard worker. And he said, here he was at the beginning, he was fighting for his life against the Chinese, then taking care of his compatriots, but always busy, always always willing to work very hard and to be an outstanding surgeon and then be an outstanding transplant surgeon. Highly unusual. Highly unusual. Sounds like he became a pretty big frog. Yeah, you're right. He was a big frog. Yes. I think he made the right decision. Mm -hmm. he got... Can't you hit this one here, Grandpa? No. The... no? No. This one. That's Skype. I want to click on here. That's Skype. You don't want Skype. Yes. 